July 24, 1991. Stanton Friedman, nuclear physicist, does an interview with former Navy SEAL and microbiologist Gerald Anderson. Anderson claims to be the last surviving witness at the date of this interview regarding the 1947 Roswell alien sighting in New Mexico. As a six-year-old boy, he recalls having seen a large, silver, disc-shaped object crashed into the side of a 400-foot gulch. Anderson believes there were two ships that were sighted in Roswell on the night of July 3rd, 1947. Theory has it that one ship was hit by lightning, causing it to collide with the other. The first ship supposedly crashed in Corona, New Mexico, causing a debris field over one mile long. The second, which Anderson claims to have seen, crashed along the plains of St. Augustine, New Mexico. Both ships, as well as the surviving aliens, Anderson claimed, were quickly recovered by military personnel. He claims the military weren't surprised when they came. He claims they knew what was at the site. This is Stanton Friedman. I'm a nuclear physicist with a very strong interest in flying saucers. I'm in Kansas City, Missouri on July 24th, 1991. I'm here to do an interview with Gerald Anderson, a very important witness with regard to the recovery of a crashed flying saucer in New Mexico in July 1947. We have just had a visit with a polygraph examiner who says he has seen no evidence of deception. This is after spending several hours with myself and Gerald. I'll sleep with Gerald. A full report will be forthcoming. So with that, we will talk to Gerald Anderson. Can you state your name, please? My name is Gerald Anderson. Where were you born and when? I was born October 4th, 1941, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Okay, and Give me a summary of what happened in 1947 with regard to a crash flying saucer in New Mexico. Well, we had just moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico on July 4th, 1947. And this was uh, approximately the, the, was the day before we went out on the plane to San Augustine with uh, my uncle Ted, my cousin Victor, my father, my brother Glenn, and myself. We drove down to the Plains of San Augustin, which is west of Socorro, New Mexico, in the Magdalena Daddle area. And we were down there looking for Bandit and Moss Agate, which, uh, according to my uncle Ted and uh, my cousin Victor, was prevalent in the area. And my brother, being a, an amateur rock hound, and wanted to get some of this. And it was a way of showing us around the area. And they had relatives down in uh, Magdalena that they wanted to introduce us to. And so we had gone down there and uh, we got down in the Horse Springs area and had uh, driven off onto the plains down an old uh, rutted road uh, for oh, a mile or so and uh, seemed like a long ways. We parked the car, got out of the car and walked down the hillside of the, the semi forested, I guess you could say it had pinyon trees and scrub oak and stuff like that on it and we'd walked uh, well, not scrub oak, but the cedar, and walk down the hillside into a, an arroyo or dry wash, and then walk south down a dry wash uh, toward where the agates were supposed to be at. And as we came around a, a bend in the arroyo that had uh, pinon and uh, cedar trees growing on it, we were able to see farther ahead down the arroyo, and on the next ridge line, there was a large silver disc shaped object. Uh, was embedded in the side of the ridge line, and uh, there was debris and, and, and wreckage and stuff uh, strewn about the area, but mainly this thing was intact. Um, I would estimate its size from an adult perspective to be something like 35 feet in diameter. I've heard other, other people who were there say they thought it was like 50 feet, but as an adult, I would say about 35 feet in diameter, quite large. When we got up to it, there were uh, four bodies there, not human. There was two of them, the 
were obviously dead. One of them was obviously very badly injured, and one of them apparently uh, suffered no ill effects, or didn't appear to be injured, and was uh, was ambulatory, was mobile. I was just sitting there next to the one that uh, was still alive that appeared to be dead. Were they right next to the vehicle? Right next to it, right under the edge of it. And uh, this craft had apparently come in from the east, bounced off one ridge line, went plowing through this arroyo area, and then crashed into the, the ridge line and embedded itself. And they were sitting back under the edge. It was kind of tilted up like this, and they were sitting back under the edge here. And uh, I'm assuming that this one creature that was all right had laid this material on the ground, but it looked like unrolled uh, tinfoil that these other three creatures were laying on. Like it was trying, like, like you do a person in shock, you know, put them on a blanket, kind of a thing. And apparently, uh, it had some boxes there around it, um, and had apparently been trying to give first aid or help these other creatures uh, when we first got there. And as we approached, um, the creature drew back like this, like it was in fear of us, like we were going to hurt it. And it wasn't very long, you know, we were trying to communicate with the adults were. And it, it seemed to calm down and just sat there and kind of looked back and forth, watching them, uh, apparently trying to figure out what was going on. Like what did it them. look like a little bit more? These creatures, all of them were all about four foot tall, four, four and a half feet tall. They had very large heads that were shaped larger on the top, and they kind of tapered down. Not to a real sharp point, but just tapered down to where they were thin. And they had very large very large, oval-shaped or almond-shaped, I guess you could say, black eyes that had, they were so shiny, they had almost a bluish tint to them when the, the light reflected off of them. Their skin coloration, uh, the best way I could describe that is kind of a bluish-tinted, milky white. Uh, it was, uh, it looked like someone in shock. And the ones that were laying on the ground were really, really looked more that way, more blue, uh, like a like. Uh, How about ears, nose, mouth? No, there was there was no visible ears on the, the creatures except like if you was just to cover your ear like this, to where there was just a rise there and then a hole, without uh, you know your earlobe and, mm -hmm. and the rest of the ear there. How about nose? Um, it was uh, the nose was very very small, almost imperceptible, uh, and just like two holes straight in. And the lips were just a straight line, just like a cut. And I, you couldn't see any visible lips like we have. It was just a slit. And what it never color? made a sound. Pardon? What hair color? There was, there was no hair. They were completely okay. bald. And no sounds? I never heard a sound of one, not out of any of the creatures, did including you, the one that was... Did you see fingers? Uh, yeah, they had, uh, they had fingers like this. They didn't have a little finger. They just had the thumb and three extra digits except the center digit was longer and the other two were about the same size. They were very long and slender. They looked very delicate and I've made the statement before and I'll make it again. I think they would have made excellent violinists because of the, 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 the structure of their hands. Um, they were wearing one-piece suits. All of them were dressed exactly the same and it was sort of a, a real shiny silverish gray color. Um, no zippers, buttons? No, I saw no zippers. No buttons. Insignia? Um, no, no insignias. The only thing that was different, you know, on, they all had this, but the only thing that was different from the, the silvery the gray thing suit was that down like the seam on the, like it was a seam on the shoulder and around the collar it was trimmed in what appeared to be maroon, like cordy. Uh, then the suits were continuous with their foot gear. You could see right about this area down, it seemed to be less pliable than it was up here, like this was a stiffer area, like they were boots or shoes or something. But they were all dressed exactly the same. Okay, so you and your family are talking back and forth, wondering what was going on. What did your family say? I mean, did well, anybody say anything? Or? Yeah, my brother, one of the first remarks I heard he made was, uh, that's a goddamn spaceship. Uh, you know, there, there was bodies up there, and you know, I was told not to go up there, which I did. And uh, how old was your brother at the time? 
Yeah, he was in his early 20s, I think 20, 21, something like that. He was a lot older than you were. Oh, yes, considerably. Uh, we, when we got up there, I kind of meandered off to one side. This thing was cocked up, and I was standing here. The bodies were here, and everybody else was kind of down here, except my cousin Victor was over here playing and looking in this gaping hole on the side of this this disc, and it, it shaped just like a, a discus, except for a round dome was up on top, and there was this big gaping gash in here where you could see inside, and it looked like a double hall. How big uh, length? The, the gash. dome? Oh, well, the gash. well, it uh, covered the greater majority from the center of the craft out. It was just like a gaping hole in there. And I'm thinking, you know, it's like about 30 feet, 35 feet in diameter, so we're talking about 17, maybe oh, okay. and most of most of that one side was ripped open like that and you could see inside and you could see another double hull up there in there and there was these rows of components that was on there and there were lights that flashed uh, on and off some of them were steady some were flashing there was a lot of debris and stuff hanging out of the hole there was uh, evidence that there had apparently been fire it looked like it had been burnt along the edge there, uh, the gash. Now this wasn't a gash that could have been caused by the thing coming into the ground. It wasn't at the leading edge of the vehicle. No, no, this was in the side like, it almost appeared it was elliptical. It almost appeared as if something the same shape as the disc we were looking at had hit that, that same, you know, okay. had hit the disc and left an imprint that pretty closely approximated the outside diameter of the disc itself. And uh, it appeared to be caved inward. Okay. And, and, and kind of like you hit it like this and just crumpled and caved in and ripped it open. Um, okay, so you're, you're there, you, you take all this and everybody's mystified. What were the circumstances outside? Hot, cold? Very, very hot. Well, to me, being the first time in New Mexico and coming from back east, that, that dry heat was just like being inside of an oven. It was unbelievable to me, and the, that was the odd part about this thing. The closer you got to it, the cooler it was. And standing under it in the shade there, uh, next to these creatures' bodies, it was like uh, refrigerated air conditioning. And did you feel air coming out of this thing? Or no, it was just like it was ambient. And I remember reaching up and putting my hand on the side of it, but I think I was afraid it was going to hit my head because. There was enough room for me as a small child, you know. Uh, uh, I was approximately the same size as these creatures to, to walk up under there and stand there, but I, I kind of did like that, put my hand up against this thing. What did it feel like? It was ice cold. It felt like it just came out of a uh, freezer. Was it smooth? Was it rough? Uh, it was very smooth. It, it had a very smooth texture to it. It was obviously made out of metal. It was very solid, and it was very cold, ice cold. And there was a smell. In the area, it smelled uh, volatile, uh, acrid like uh, acetone, and that seemed to be coming out of that gash, that smell. Uh, but the closer you got to this thing, the, the cooler it was. So I, you know, I kind of remained there, and I guess that while they were over here, my father and uh, my uncle Ted and my brother, and Uncle Ted was trying to talk to this thing in Spanish, and of course, it didn't understand a word he said. And Dad tried to talk to it, and then they tried, you know, sign language, and that didn't work. And uh, I don't know, for some reason, I just, uh, I reached down and touched it, this one that was laying next to me. And uh, when I touched it, I realized, you know, I jumped back. It scared me, it startled me, because I, I suddenly realized that these weren't dolls. I thought they were plastic dolls. And I, you know, I was still in my mind that these are moving dolls until I touched it and I realized, you know, this was a dead thing. I'd, I'd been, I'd seen dead relatives before and I unfortunately had made the mistake one time of touching a relative who was in a casket and I just knew this was a dead thing and it scared me and I ran around behind my father and my uncle and um, this thing was sitting there on the ground and it kept looking back and forth and it just had its hands like this in its lap and it just kept looking back and forth between uh, the three of them and you know, like it was trying to understand and all of a sudden it just turned and looked right straight at me 
between my Uncle Ted and myself. And uh, this is when it was just like an explosion of things in my head, just things I started, you know, feeling just terrible depression and loneliness and fear and uh, just, you know, awful, awful feelings that just suddenly burst into my mind. And I don't know if that meant that it was communicating with me and I was the only one there I could communicate with because I was a kid. I, I don't know. I turned and, and ran, and I ran across the Arroyo and up on the area that it had bounced off of during the crash. And was just standing there looking down at the scene, you know, and my family, and uh, off in the distance I could see cattle grazing, I could see a windmill, and I could see dust trails out on the, the, the playa, out on the plains out there. And, uh, oh, I was there for a little while, and then I, I came back down, and I guess we were there, you know, Victor was in, when I got back down there, Victor was up in the crack, and Ted yelled at him to get out of there, and Glenn went over and grabbed him by the belt and jerked him off. That's your brother. Yeah, and jerked him off and said, get out of there, you could cause this thing to explode and kill us all, you know, and then, of course, he went prowling around in there. Uh, I was kind of standing off to one side looking, that's why I knew that there was, I could look off these rocks that I was standing on look right into this thing. That's why I knew, you know, about the lights and the, and the components and stuff. And then, uh, I don't know, I heard other people talking and I turned and there was a group of people coming up the Arroyo from out on the plains from the south. They had come up there and of course they walked up and was talking and... Uh, How many? Uh, there was uh, an older man and five younger students. Uh, boys, girls? There was three boys and two girls. And they were all, you know, introducing, talking to uh, my father and my uncle and my brother. What did the older one look like? The, the leader of this group, yep. the man. <coughs> he, was a, he was a very tall man, a very big man. He, uh, he was wearing a pit helmet when he first came up, one of those kind of explorer helmets. And uh, he was bald, and I know that because he had taken it off and he had done this, you know, a couple times with a handkerchief and put it back on. He was a balding man. And he had a round face. He was very ruddy complected. He was a big man. Uh, and he apparently was a, a doctor because he, they kept calling him doctor. And it, as I understand it, it was an archaeological group that was out there on some kind of summer thing. And uh, they, they talked. And he apparently was able to speak several foreign languages. And he tried to talk to this creature several times in different languages, and again, to no avail. How did it happen to be there? Had he seen the thing? Well, they claimed that they saw, they said they saw this thing come down the night before, or flaming, you know, and they thought it was a meteorite. And they had uh, talked about, well, in the morning, you know, we'll, we'll go over there and see this, where this meteor came down, because that's what they thought it was. And when the sun came up the next morning, you know, and they got about their business and got up and somebody looked over and said, you know, they saw all the shiny metal and stuff across the plains there and they realized it wasn't a meteorite, but it may have been an airplane and that crashed. So they all decided to go over there and see if there was anybody who was alive, you know, that was hurt that needed help. They had driven on it? No, they walked over, apparently, the way I understand it. Uh, and it's quite a ways across that plane, so it, it had to take a, a very long time to do this. Uh, or they may have had a vehicle, I don't know. Uh, that's an assumption, I think, on my part. Uh, with the, the okay, so they're the, around with the family. But they came across the, the planes, nonetheless. I, I'm not sure if they drove or not. I didn't hear any drive. And then somebody else showed up. Yeah, they were down there just, oh, 15, maybe 20 minutes, the tops, you know. and. They were picking up things, some of the students, and uh, this Dr. Buskirk that they called him, this one girl went up and said, look, doctor, wouldn't this make a beautiful ring? And she was holding what looked like a, a red rod, uh, uh, a red tube of some kind, it was kind of a silvery red. And he kind of snapped at her, you know, and put that down, Agnes, you don't know what that is, I think it hurts you, just don't pick this stuff up. And she kind of said, well, yeah, okay, doctor. And then he went back to what he was doing, and she walked away and put it in her pocket. And a lot of them were doing this, sort of picking up things and feeling things. I was picking up things and feeling things. There was uh, all kinds of material, metal, and stuff laying around. And then we heard it, I heard it, well, we all heard it, a sound of a motor coming like a truck. 
And I went back up the, the incline there to the to the ridge line, and I could see out there, and there was a truck coming up. It was an old pickup truck. It was sort of a, a, a beige color or a tan colored thing, and it had a whip antenna on it. And it stopped, and this guy got out, and he's wearing brown clothes, he's got boots on, and he's wearing a straw hat, just like the kind Harry Truman always wore. And he had wire rim glasses. He was a big man. And he looked exactly like Harry Truman to me. And I, you know, I'd seen in the movie tone news that the, he was, was president the, then. <laughs> yeah, I, I was well aware who Harry Truman was, so everybody was. He was our, kind of a hero, you know. And this guy looked like him, except bigger, bigger. And I don't think he, and he didn't look as old either. Uh, his hair was uh, kind of uh, light gray. And uh, he walked over there, and they got to talking. You know, he knew everybody and. He told them that he worked out on the planes out there and that he made maps and that he had seen the the wreckage from out there on the planes and he saw the people and he thought it was a plane wreck and he knew or was something was going on and he came over there to see. And he hadn't been there but just a very, very few minutes when we heard all kinds of motors and, and engine straining and stuff. And uh, here comes a military car with a big white star on the side of it, followed by a 6 by which is a, a military truck with a kind of a canvas wagon uh, mm -hmm. uh, canvas thing over it, and it's full of soldiers, they've got guns, and right behind that was what we call a 4 by which is like a, a medium-sized uh, Jeep truck situation, and it had two big high whip antennas, all kinds of radio gear in the back, and a guy back there with earphones and stuff on it, and he's you know, working these radios, and they all pulled up and stopped. And uh, which direction had they come from? Then? They came from from the north, from Horse, the Horse Springs area, right? So right they could south. have come off the highway there. The oh way yeah, you... I'm, I'm sure that's exactly how they got there. They come off the highway the same way we did. Well, in the meantime, that when it stopped, the this black soldier, the sergeant, and the reason I know he was a sergeant, my brother told me he was, and he got out of this. Uh, this car, and then a guy got out on the other side, and he was, Glenn said he was a, he was a captain, he told me later he was a captain, and this guy had orange-red hair, and uh, the, all the soldiers of them came running over there, pointing guns at people, and telling them, get away, get away, get away, you know, and when this creature saw these people, the military, he went nuts. He went into an absolute panic, worse than what he did when he saw us. Uh, did he move around, or just his eyes? Or? Uh, he he just he just oh he okay. crazy, and it was like he was looking fearful. For, yeah, like a, like he's looking for a place to run and hide. But he never got up. Never got up. He never left the one injured one next to him. And uh, this redheaded officer, this guy was a real butthole. Uh, he made all the threats. He threatened to have people shot. They didn't move. To away. everybody? Oh, yeah. Get away, get away. You know, we'll shoot. Get away from there. This is a military secret. You know, just screaming and hollering. And he, he told my, my uncle and my father that if they didn't want to spend the rest of their life in prison, they would never say anything about what they saw there. If they ever wanted to see us kids again, they'd take the kids away. They'd never see the kids, you know, meaning me and, and Victor. That we'd better keep our mouths shut. If we did not, this is what was going to happen. Uh, they were threatening people and pushing people. And the students as well. And Dr. Oh Lester. yeah, they were they were they were hustling everybody. And one of the soldiers uh, pushed my my uncle. He had to have a rifle, I guess, and he shoved him back like that. Well, that was something you don't do to my uncle Ted. Uh, Ted had a violent temper, and he grabbed the rifle and reached over top and smacked this guy and dropped him right there. Ted had dropped, fight had dropped with a hat. This guy's a cowboy. He, he, he'll hit you in a minute. And of course, when he did that, uh, there was bolts opened, and I guess cocking, you know, they were cocking their rifles, and they were pointing guns at people, and uh, everybody buskered, and Glenn and Dad grabbed him, you know, pulled him back and got him away. Don't, don't, man, they're going to shoot. Don't do that, you know, trying to stop this. And I think we came very close to having someone shot. Uh, then they really started threatening, you know, and they entered. Well, did the redhead do all the talking, pretty much? Too? Pretty much, uh, except once in a while, the sergeant would, would, you know, would 
chime in and, and make statements like that to other people in response to the redhead. But mainly, it was the redheaded. Was there cat. a name tag? Yes, there was, and uh, his name was Armstrong. And I'm not sure if I know that from having read it, or know that from remembering it. Now being able to read it in my memory, or if someone said that to me. But his name was Armstrong, was right here on his uniform. Now, they chased you guys away pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, they did. And uh, they herded us up like cattle, and they moved us up the Arroyo, back in the direction we'd come from, over the protest of this Dr. Buskirk who said, no, no, we've got to go the other way. We came from over I don't care where you came from. Get your ass up the, the uh, Arroyo. And they ran us up the Arroyo. And... Uh, so you get to your car then. Right. Now they take us up the Arroyo and just below the hill that we came down, they broke us off and moved us up the hill. Now this whole time, no one has ever frisked us down. No one has ever checked our pockets to see if we picked up any of this material. And this girl, Agnes, still has that stuff in her pocket and some of the other students had stuff. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, at the, up to that point, they had not been searched. Whether they did so afterward, I don't know. They never searched us, ever. They run us back up the hill, and uh, when we got to where the car was parked, where Dad had parked the car up there, there's a Jeep with a guy sitting in the back, and there's a mounted machine gun in the back of this Jeep, and all these soldiers. The Jeep pulls out. We're told to get in the car. We follow the Jeep, and the soldiers go with us all the way back out to the highway. When we get back out to the highway, they set us right there. They wouldn't let us out of the car. They wouldn't let us move forward. It would, I don't know whether they're making a decision or what. When we got out to the highway, this place was absolutely full of military personnel, military equipment. There was airplanes sitting out there that they had landed on the highway. Did you see any airplanes when you were back at the site? Yeah, there was airplanes in the sky, but nobody thought much about it. You know, I didn't think anything about it. I was used to airplanes being in the sky, having... You know, been raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, the home of the Northern bomb site. You know, the sky was always full of military aircraft. I never thought nothing about it. And when we get back out to the highway, there's observation aircraft, you know, high-winged aircraft, and there's one, what I know now, to be a C-47 sitting there. And how we didn't hear that lands beyond me. And how he land, well, of course, I guess you could land if you're a good pilot out there. So there's no trouble poles or anything. And it was, they had tore the fence down on the north side of that highway. And all this equipment was setting back up there, and that plane was up there, and they were taking stuff out of the plane. There was uh, military ambulances, and there was trucks with, uh, like, uh, uh, wreckers, cranes on them. And there was uh, tankers, like maybe had fuel or water in them. There was just, everywhere you looked, there was military. And A major recovery work. operation. Yeah, it looked like an invasion force. It really did. And they were all wearing... These these light light khaki uniforms. They didn't look like you know olive drafts. They were light khaki, and they all had the same patch over there. That kind of blue funny patch with the the circles on it was was on their shoulder. And a did lot you have of, any clue as to where they came from? Did your brother or your uncle? No, I I don't know where they came from. Uh, I don't think anybody ever ascertained that. Uh, there were a lot of them had MP patches. And, it were, and some of them were wearing nightsticks off of these uh, webbed utility belts. They had nightsticks and they had 45s and holsters, you know, the, the automatics in, in the full of the holster. And these were the people who were given most of the orders. They had the road barricaded off out there, and we sat there for a very long time, and, you know, we were getting thirsty and everything, and we asked, you know, if we could go back to Horse Springs and get some water. Oh, no, no, you can't go through there. And right after that, they said, no, you just turn around and you head out of here now. And you go to Socorro, and you and this is a redhead again. You keep your mouth shut, just keep going, and don't look back. Well, it, so we drove away, you know, and Dad and I said, hell, we'll, we'll, get, we'll go to Magdalena, we'll get water in Magdalena, you know, because that's where John Trujillo lived, his relative was dead. And uh, so as we drove away, I was looking out the back window, and I could see Dr. Busker and these kids and that guy that got out of the pickup was standing there, and this Dr. Buskirk was doing this like this in this red-headed officer's face, and he kept pointing back behind him. 
And I guess that meant, you know, we got to go back that way. And he was fed up with this guy or something. He was shaking his finger in his face while they were yelling at each other. And that's pretty much the last I saw of the whole situation. I don't know what happened after that because we just kept going. Did you get home before dark? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was before dark. Of course, it was in the summertime, so it didn't get dark until way late. And uh, we stopped in, in Magdalena very briefly and, you know, and then just kept going. And uh, the adults were really funny, you know, they were really scared. And I had very rarely, you know, well, of course, I didn't know him that well, but over the years, I knew that Ted was not much of a disciplinarian. He really didn't discipline the kids that much. But he really knocked the fire out of old Victor. He, and Victor, we're not going to talk about what we just saw. I just saw him. Ted kept telling him, shut up, don't talk about it. I don't, don't, nobody's talking about this. Finally, he just turned around and knocked the living hell out of uh, Victor for uh, shooting his mouth off. Did Ted work at Sandia then? Yes, he did. He was. Uh, he did something out there in the technical area. I don't know. Had a clearance. Yes. And uh, later, your dad worked out at Sandia. Yes, he did. As a and he worked there for years until he retired. Until he retired, my dad had some very high clearances. Okay. Um, when we got home, we mom was over at Uncle Ted's house and. Mom perceived instantly that something was wrong. I said, what's wrong with Larry? He's wondering what it is. I can't even imagine. They decided to tell him. Well, when they did, then, of course, Isabel, oh, oh my God, you saw demons, you saw the devil. Cause he Isabel was Ted's wife. Ted's wife, a devoutly religious Catholic person who thinks anything that isn't uh, a vision of, say, the Virgin Mary or of Jesus is, quote, unquote, demons. And if that's what we saw, and, of course, Ted, you know, off. And we really never talked about it much in the family because of the reaction it got. And my dad was really afraid, and so was Ted. They were, they were, and Glenn especially, because Glenn made the statement about when he first saw the military, he told my father, he said, uh, and, and Ted and everybody there, don't let them some bitches know I'm a Marine. Don't let them know. And of course nobody did, and he was in civilian clothes, so, you know, he got a pair of uh, blue jeans on, you know, and it was a civilian clothes, so, you know, he didn't look like military, or I'm sure his ass had been in real trouble. Uh, and they never checked. They just assumed, yeah, I guess, that we were... Did right. they ask your names? Oh, yeah, they took our names. Uh, they got all that from my dad. And, and my brother just very cursory would, you know, very, very hard to talk to him at all. He liked dad, and Ted did most of the talking, which was pretty smart of under the circumstances, and of course, they never really asked me any questions at all. You were just uh, a kid. Yeah, I was just a kid. And uh, well, you first went public with this. Now, let's first square away. All the other four that you were with are dead. Yes. Yes. It's my been brother, some time. And my brother died of a heart attack in Mexico City. My dad died of a heart attack in '78. Uh, and uh, Ted and uh, Victor were killed in an automobile accident in the mid-60s, and I assume it was 65. Okay. Right, now, there's a strange diary that's turned up. Uh, how did that happen? Well, when I went to my father's funeral in 1978, uh, a lot of Dad's belongings were, personal belongings were given to us boys. You didn't live in the area at the time. Oh, no. You've I gone in, off to yeah, the military. I, I, and... Yeah, I've been in the military, and then subsequently, on the return to the military, moved to Colorado immediately. And, uh... Your dad had remarried a couple of times, and... Oh yeah, this was uh, so. Dad was on his third wife, <laughs> and uh, he his personal belongings and stuff, you know, were kind of given to my two brothers and myself. And my cousin Valley Jean was there at the funeral. That's and, Ted's daughter. Yes, and she came up and was talking to me, and she said, uh, "Here, uh, you were there. You need." to have this too, and she handed me these photocopies. And at first, you know, I thought, well, you know, what is this dad's diary? And she said, no, it's my dad's diary, but you were there, you need to have this. And then it dawned on me what I was looking at, and uh, you know, because I read a little bit of it. And so I said, yeah, okay, you know, and I didn't want to talk about it at the funeral because Roz's side of the family, God bless That's her. That's your dad's third wife. Yeah, yeah, God bless her, I loved her. 
But they were very religious, and they would have viewed this exactly the same way as Isabel had as evil. And I really didn't want to have any problems with them. Uh, you know, but we were kind of on shaky terms. We didn't see eye to eye religiously, so we're, we're not quite here. Well, you're active in religion now, aren't you? Oh yes, yes. You're a deacon in the Episcopal Church, right? Okay, that means you actively participate. Well, in yeah, a uh, lay Eucharistic minister. Okay. Well, I, I, yes, I actively participate. I serve on the altar. What do you do for a living now? I'm a security officer in the state of Missouri. And you've been doing police sort of work for several years now. Oh, yes, yes. About nine years all told. And you also are going to college to be a nurse, and you've already got a couple of associate degrees from community college. Right, yes. And one associate of science and one associate of general studies, and I'm working toward my bachelor's of nursing. And in roughly two years, I will have my bachelor of nursing will be on license. Now to be a security officer you have to be licensed by the state of Missouri? Do you? Yes, you have to be a certified law enforcement officer, which means that you have to have gone to the state academy, the uh, Department of Public okay. Safety. So that's not just a pickup thing? Uh, oh no, no, you have to it's a professional. the academy. Yes, yeah. it's definitely. Okay. Um, and you have to, to, to work for the, the state under these conditions, you have to not only be certified, but you have to have prior law enforcement experience. Now, when we get back to the diary for just a minute, uh, when you were hypnotized by John Carpenter, a psychiatric social worker, and he was asking you questions about the diary, apparently you'd been told that there were a number of copies of that around? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Something buried out maybe there too? Yeah, as I understood. Well, in fact, in conversations with Valley Jean after the fact, after I got involved in this thing through the Unsolved Mysteries thing, uh, I was told that that wasn't the only diary. That what I had was a, was a copy, well, it was a photocopy. Okay. And uh, that there were a lot of these copies around, and apparently Uncle Ted or someone had, had Put these out through different people in the family and friends and stuff uh, for reasons I don't know to keep them from getting lost or something like that. You okay, know, now when I case. asked you for the original, you contacted who? Why, well, yeah, Valley Jean. That was Valley Jean. Okay, right. she was in a convent. Right. And she was reluctant to do anything. You had to call a number of times, as I recall. That's, that's correct. And you talked to the bishop? Somebody talked. Yeah, I talked to a bishop. Uh, and he convinced her to send the stuff to me. Yes, apparently. Okay, because I got it directly from Colorado with a cover letter that strongly indicated that she didn't want any more to do with this. That was part of the agreement. Mm -hmm. But that she considered this the work of the devil or words to that effect anyway. Is yeah, that I think problem? she's of the same opinion that her, her mother was. Okay, that so... It was uh, the work of the devil. And you see, all I ever had of this was the, was the photographic copies that I had showed you originally, and as I understand it, you received the original I received the original from original. which those have been made. They were partly burnt. She mentioned she had intended to burn them, but because of your persistence and with the agreement that I never contacted her, she would send them to me. And as you know, when I had forensic analysis done, it showed that the ink dated from the early 70s. The paper could have been available in 47, so it was clearly not an original. But it was also done before there was any publicity about this case anywhere, because I know I was the first one to get involved. Exactly. Now, um, as you know, we have discovered, not I, but uh, you had identity sketches done by a police artist of the various people involved in this. Right. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there is a picture, several pictures that seem to indicate that Dr. Buskirk uh, was Dr. Winfred Buskirk, uh, who had received his PhD at the University of New Mexico. And you had described him as in his late 30s, early 40s. It turns out he was 39 in 1947. He was bald and been bald most of his life, even up to then. Uh, did, was there other contact between you and he at that time, as far as you know? Your family and him, or? Uh, I don't know. Okay, not I, I don't think, I don't, not to my knowledge, I don't, I don't believe my dad uh, had ever contacted him. There's a possibility that Ted may have, and I'm not sure why I, uh, I think Valley Jean had alluded to the fact that uh, Ted had been in contact with him, 
and uh, that they had corresponded and this kind of thing. But uh, as far as uh, any personal knowledge of it, no. Okay, now you didn't tell your story really until the Unsolved Mysteries program was rerun in January of 1990? That's right. That's when you contacted them, got my address, wrote me, wrote yeah, Kevin I mean, Randall, yeah. and that was were a little kind of, upset that the program wasn't quite accurate. Well, yeah, that was the whole thing. It started off as a fluke to begin with, because everything that I saw didn't didn't jive with what I had seen personally. Yeah. And I guess I was kind of miffed, you know, here all these years, I had been primarily forced, you know, by not only by others, but by, you know, my own sense of uh, survival to keep my mouth shut, and then, wow, here it is, it's on TV, and he got it wrong. And so, you well, know, I just impulsively called the number and told the lady, wait a minute, you know, that whole thing was wrong. Why do you know that, sir? And I said, well, because I was there, that's why. And boy, that really, that apparently pulled somebody's string. Yeah, and the key thing that was wrong, of course, there were a few mistakes in an otherwise excellent program, was that they had that. Uh, the Barney Barnett, the civil engineer story, over near Corona, and you knew that it was over in the in the plains. Right. There's a lot more. Examples. Well, yeah, and then the fact that the thing looked like a, a tent flat hat or a tent top hat, and it, it didn't. It was this shape, and the Barney Barnett or whoever the guy in the truck was did not drive right up to it on a road. It wasn't parked conveniently next to a. Yeah. The thoroughfare, you know, right. and uh, there was it was just things like that. And I I don't know, I just for some reason I thought, well, you know, geez, look, it's already public. <laughs> yeah, the story's out, and let's get it right, you know. Of course, I didn't. I don't think I realized at the time, you know, how involved this was going to be. But <laughs> what, what kind of response? You live and learn. <laughs> now I got you together with uh, John Carpenter, the psychiatric social worker, and you guys had several sessions and. Then uh, we flew out to the site. Uh -huh. uh, you're reasonably convinced now that the second time around out there, we fit, did find the exact location. Yeah, the, the first time in, I, you know, it was like 43 years. And, and we're in a I, helicopter, which you would never in, Yeah, I was in the air this time, and the yeah, last time I was underground. And so, you know, the landmarks were a little confusing. I was positive I was in the right place. But until we actually got on the ground, John and I, and retraced the yep. route in there that we had come in in the car, uh, I wasn't absolutely sure. There was two ridge lines there, and I wasn't really sure of which one it was. And I had the feeling that the first one that I, I pointed out was the correct one, but once I went in on the ground on foot with John, I knew instantly that it wasn't that one, it was the other one, and I'm absolutely positive. That's where I was at. There's no question in my mind. And you will recall that you described the woman who sold you the pop on the way in. Right. And, and we found the said, older woman there who said that was exactly what she looked like. That's right. Room, so. And I'll never forget that lady because I, uh, well, I had it with heat, I'm telling you. Backseat of that 40 Plymouth, uh, down those dirty old roads and stuff, and for mile after mile. And of course, my dad was one of these kind of people when he got in a car. It was point A to point B nonstop. I don't know why. You just never stop to smell the roses along the way. And uh, so, you know, I was pretty sad shape. And, you know, I, I remember that lady quite well. What kind of response have you had? You went public. I mean, John talked to a newsman. You both talked. He called me in the Springfield newspaper. Paper, paper carried a very straight, very large article. And that got spread around by lots of people. So suddenly you're a celebrity, if you will. What kind of reaction from the people who knew you on, on campus where you worked, your friends? Oh, uh, very, very few negativists. There, there's the noisy negativists, you know. We, we have those. Uh, but in general, but it, it the, generally in general, supportive. Ninety-nine percent of the people were incredibly supportive. Uh, only one professor at the university. Uh, was of the negativist type that was vocal about it. Everybody else is just 100% supportive. The majority of these people are absolutely convinced, even without this story, that extraterrestrial uh, life forms exist and that the people are flying around out there and moving between systems and stuff. And it, it was just, it's just an unbelievable amount of support. You didn't lose your job. Oh, your no. boss fact, didn't give you a hard time. Absolutely not. In fact, uh, I think it's, I can, I can publicly say that uh, my boss was extremely supportive because he is a uh, avid uh, ufologist himself. He, he's 
fascinated by the subject, and uh, you won't have any problem convincing him either. And my boss has a master's degree. He's not someone that's untrained observer that's given to hallucination. Uh, most of the people who are the most supportive of me are people with very high educations, very, very solid education, very solid, outstanding, brilliant people, uh, mm -hmm. given to hallucination. You went, you attended a UFO conference uh, with John Carpenter, and he gave a paper, I guess, and introduced you. Uh -huh, I sure did. And you've got a response from that audience, too. Yeah, 100% supportive. I was really, quite relieved and made very, very welcome. Well, you've been interviewed by a number of other people, uh, Linda Howe working on a documentary and so forth, uh, seems to have bought the story. Now, uh, how much contact did you have with Kevin Randall? Uh, a very brief telephone call. Uh, I came home from work one day and there was a message on my answering machine, and as you well know, I, I have a tendency to be hard to get a hold of. Yes. <laughs> left his number and of course I had his address and I, I and yours and I had sent cards to both of you and something to the effect that you want to know what really happened after he called me yeah. and uh, he had called and I wasn't there and he had left his number so I returned his call now uh, I talked to him very briefly uh, primarily because I didn't like the man's attitude I don't feel comfortable with people who call other people liars and charlatans and phonies and say that they rig their research to make it come out the way they want. And when someone starts telling me this kind of thing, then the first thing I want to do is I want to get away from them. And this is exactly what I did. Now, I understand that this man claims that I talked to him for two hours and that he has a two hour tape of one contradiction after another of me, and that's not quite true. Okay, there's been no other contact with him. No other contact. I won't give the man a time of day. Yeah. And, uh, Has any other investigator, any of the noisy negativists approached you directly? No, none at all. The only other investigator is you yourself or Don Berliner and, and uh, Bob Bigelow and John Carpenter. Okay. And, uh, and of course, you're quite familiar with our, our involvement. And you uh, agree that uh, on that first trip to the planes, it was you, I, Bob Bigelow, and a pilot in the helicopter. Yeah, uh, Joe Channing, the pilot, was in the front seat on the left side. I was in the front seat on the right side. You were directly behind me. No. You were directly behind the pilot on the left side, and Bob Bigelow was directly behind me on the, on the passenger side. Right, and then we met up with eventually with uh, Don Berliner and right. John Carpenter, they and we spent at, the next three days. They together. drove to Dattle, they drove the Jeeps and stuff to Dattle, and were waiting for us at Dattle when we landed in the uh, highway island out there. Right, and as you recall, where did we refuel the helicopter? Uh, Springerdale, Arizona. Because so it's not far to Arizona. Arizona. Oh, no, no, it was just a matter of a few minutes, actually, 30, 25, 25 minutes maybe at the max, uh, west of where we were located. All right, I think uh, we may pick this up another time, but I think that'll do us for now. I really appreciate the time and trouble and effort and all the rest of that, and on to bigger and better things. Gerald Anderson would be 82 years old if he was alive today. His witness testimony has been a debate for skeptics for years claiming his story has changed over time with other interviewers. Research online shows no record of him after 1993.